In the cheeriest from the sky, everybody's going to wild. You can keep a song, you can choose a house, you can get the kingdom in. Yeah. And our enemies gonna pay, I wanna see that day. If you believe what the Bible says, Get ready for the good times up ahead. Stay focused, child. It's the minute we gon' be in the kingdom yet. You don't believe it. I can't wait to see it. I just wanna be there. If you're with me, let me know you're with me. Say yeah. Can I see the Savior in front of me? I'll be so happy then. Fall on my knees and pick. Hold my hands in the air. In the land of Israel, where we belong. Oh, help me sing the songs of Zion, y'all. That's what I'm waiting for. When them chariots come in the sky And everybody's gonna know why We're the chosen people Oh, oh yeah, yeah You see the Bible says that it's a righteous thing to recompense tribulation from those that trouble you. And we gon' get the kingdom, yeah. And after everything they did, we gon' get them back again. We gon' get the kingdom, yeah. I know some of y'all don't like that, but that's the truth. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh yeah, all praise is to the Most High, Heavenly Father, and His glorious Son, and His glorious Son, and His glorious Son. Hallelujah. That's a wonderful thing to know, that after everything, everything they did, after everything they did, that we're going to get them back again. That's why I wanted to play that song, because... We've been dealing with the reversal of the curses that were put on the Israelites who lost their name in slavery and then became a byword and a proverb and a reproach among the nation as they called them nigger, negro, coon, porch monkey, spade, blackie, as they called them all those bywords and proverbs. We're going to get them back for that. As our forefathers was chained and put on ship, put on ships, stacked like sardines, thrown overboard and eaten by sharks, tracked down and killed and hunted for sport. After everything that they did, as our ancestors went into the cotton fields and began to work and pick cotton 16, 17 hours a day, Dying at by the by the time they get twenty years old 
because they've been worked so hard in the in the minefields that their lifespan was cut short to about uh, seven seven to ten years after the age of about seventeen. So the average average one of our grandfathers, our great grandfathers, the average age that they would live to would be about twenty seven years old. That's how hard they were worked in the minefields. <laughs> We only hear about the cotton fields. They don't tell you about the mine fields and the railroad and the hard labor, busting rock and, and digging tunnels. That they worked our ancestors so hard that after about seven years of that work on a daily basis that they would perish, they would just die. After everything they did, as they cut open the body of the most detestable creature on the planet, and then fed us the guts, the bowels, after everything that they did, raping our children, raping our grandmothers, raping our wives and our faces, faces and daring us to do anything about it. After everything they did, blockaded us from getting a good education and told us a thousand and one lies that have caused us to be stagnant until this day after everything they did we gonna get them back again we gonna get them back again we gonna get them back again i guarantee it somebody holler if y'all hear me holler if y'all hear me we're gonna get them back again so you know what i want to do i want to run that song right back again i want to run that song right back again yep that's what i want to do because that song says something real significant. It says it's a righteous thing to recompense tribulation on those that trouble you. So, so that's what that is. We're going to get them back again. We're going to get them back again. Let the little commercial play out. And that's what I want you to focus on. I want you to focus on that scripture. I can see that say it's a righteous thing to recompense tribulation on those that trouble us yep that's what it is all about i know it's hard israel so let's go let's run it back while i tag a couple more people we're talking about the reversal of the curses the curses are coming off the the negro the slave the one that been in poverty it's been a long time but it's coming it's gonna be okay so don't stop. We ain't gonna stop. Yep. Stay faithful. The Most High is calling his people home. Back to his word. Back to his commandment. This is why they're afraid of UFOs. They still putting bywords and proverbs on us, calling us extraterrestrials when our brothers crack the sky. You don't believe me? Israel, Negroes, let me know you're with me. Say, yeah, hey, yeah. When them chariots come in the sky, and everybody's going to know why. They're going to know why. Slavery is why. Murder by the police is why. Poverty is why. And our enemies are going to pay. And I want to see that day. And he ain't going to have blonde hair and blue eyes. He's going to look just like that.
woolly hair and eyes as a flame of fire and feet like in the fine brass as though they burned in a furnace. And when his children come, when them chariots come, because he coming in the clouds with ten thousands of his saints to ex execute judgment upon his enemies. And I want to see the day Do you believe it? We're going to get the kingdom. You see, the Bible says that it's a righteous thing to recompense tribulation to those that trouble you. And we're going to get the kingdom, yeah. And after everything they did, we're going to get them back again. We're going to get the kingdom, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know some of you Gentiles don't like that, but it's the truth. Oh, yeah. And they don't have no choice. They don't like it, but it's the truth. You better believe it. It's the truth. You better believe it, baby. You better believe it. Now, I got something that I'm going to start this, start this off with. Because after everything they did, I just rang off a few things that they done. Right now, they are still doing things. Our brothers are still being murdered in the streets. Our brothers are still being murdered in the streets. Our sisters are coming up missing. Our daughters are coming up missing. Our men still can't get jobs. Crack and all kind of dope is still being dropped in our community. Guns are still being dropped in our community as the younger brothers still killing each other after everything they done see these are things that they are doing in this hour as they police shoot down look for our men to shoot down as the court system is still locking our men up let me tell you something baby the bible said it is a righteous thing to recompense tribulation on those that have troubled you you see i don't care what nobody say they can call me a racist all they want. Racism ain't got nothing to do with reaping what you sow. You're going to get back everything that you gave out. Even until this day, we are watching the Most High rebuke this wicked kingdom and tear this wicked kingdom down. And they still, because of their arrogance, are in rebellion and will not bend their knee. So, we're going to see and continue to watch the reversal of the curses that was put on the Negro because of his disobedience to the Most High. As the Negro, the Israelite that dwell in Jerusalem, according to Luke 21st chapter, verses 20 through 24, read these scriptures so that you can understand who you are and who this book is talking about. As they ran, into the mountains of what is known today as Africa to hide amongst people that look like them from Roman persecution. They were now turned on by them that called themselves African, the Hamitic people, hooked up and in cahoots, cahoots with the European man that now begin to remove the Israelites because only the African, only the Hamite man knew the difference between his people and Israelite people. The Europeans didn't know the difference, but the Hamite knew the difference. So the Hamite was able to gather up all of the Israelites and then put them in the hands of the European people and then remove them far from their borders. That's the scripture. So we're talking about the things that's happening to the Negro because of his disobedience and rebellion against the Most High. All of these things transpired. But the people that put these things on us, one day they themselves will suffer. Because the only reason why we suffer is because we transgress the Most High's law. That is why this wicked empire that we've been a part of, uh, inducted into Christianity, told the Negro that the law was done away with. Because he know as long as the Negro continue to break the father's law, that the curses will continue to perpetuate themselves down one generation to the next. And we got 
some Christian that uh, somebody that called himself a Christian that'll jump up and start talking about, well, well, let's say that the law was nailed to the cross. Well, let me ask you a question. If that be the case, was the curses that reside, reside still on the Negro and nobody else, were they nailed to the cross too? I didn't think so. Because I don't care what church you go to that's telling you that the law was done away with. When you look in the community that you live in, you can see clearly that the law ain't done away with because your people are still up under the curses. So, so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about reversing the curses. But before the curses can be reversed, you got to be able to identify with who the curses are on in the first place. And the average black person that's walking around don't even believe that they got no curse on them because they in church. Or because one person out of a thousand might have a good job and live in the suburbs. You can't deny the fact that the vast majority of us as a people, as a nation of people, are still the most impoverished people, the most uneducated people, the people that are in the worst class of um, Amongst all the other people, the people that still don't have no businesses, the people that still don't have no health care, that still don't have no savings, that still don't have none of these things. So, so we make these videos with these curses because we aim to show our brothers that reside in the religious constructs or still the Akins of the world. That are partakers of the accursed thing, bringing about a whole accursed on all of Israel because they don't know who they are. When the Bible is spelling it out plain and clear who they are through slavery. Slavery is the common ground that every person of color has in this country and scattered abroad. No matter what religious construct you're a part of, we all have common ground through slavery because our ancestors came on the same boats. And if that be the case, then you have to ask yourself, if our ancestors came on the same boats and at one point in time we was all of one mind, how do we end up with so many different diversities of illusions? This one over here is Jehovah Witness. This one over here is a Christian. This one over here is a Muslim. This one over here is in the Buddhism. This one is in secularism. This one's in masonry. This one's in humanism. This one's in monotheism. This one over here is in atheism. Because we've been a, become a part of every religious institution on the planet. Yet we have common ground because none of us would be here if our ancestors didn't get off that boat. And when they got off that boat, they was of one mind. How be it that we got to this point because everybody that's a part of all these different organizations they are still without a name they can't tell you who they are nationally and so they have to fulfill the prophecies in the book of Isaiah first chapter I have nourished the children and brought them up talking about bringing them out of Egypt but they have rebelled against me therefore the ox shall know who his owner is. Ownership symbolizes fatherhood. The ox will know who his owner is. And the jackass, that old stupid donkey, that stubborn donkey, he will know where his manager's crib is. That manager's crib is talking about the dwelling place, my homeland. He said that jackass will know where his manager's crib at. He said, but my people, when you want to know who Israel is, you go and look at the people that you, if you ask them a question where they came from. They couldn't tell you what land they come from. They might say they came from Africa, but they came with pinpoint accuracy identify no particular geographical location in Africa that they came from. He see that jackass is wiser in his way than the most highest people is. He said, this is a marker that I'm going to put on Israel. So let me tell you something, Christian, Jehovah Witness, Muslim. Let me tell you something. Can you tell me where you came from, where your homeland came from? Because you can't be an African and an American at the same time because African is one continent and America is another continent. And Africa is named after a European conqueror by the name of Cyprio. Africanus, European, and then America is named after Amerigo Vespucci, a navigator and map maker, European. If you are African American, that means that you bear a European name. Both African and American are European names, with both or two continents that you have no blood ties to. So you become 
as that that donkey, that jackass, is wiser than the father's people. Because that jackass, you can take him miles away from home and drop him off, and he'll find his way back home. But when somebody come and ask you, Jehovah Witness, are you the descendant of a slave? You ain't got but one choice, one answer to that question. You can't do nothing but say yes. Because if it wasn't not for slavery, you wouldn't be here. But when they ask you, well, where did your ancestors come from? See, you dumber than a jackass. You dumber than a jackass. And you can think you think you can talk to people, the, the 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 family that the most high committed his word to? He said, You'll know Israel when you see him. Because Israel's dumber than this jackass right here. He can't even tell you where he came from. You see? He said, now look, you'll know Israel when you see him because he's dumber than this ox. Now, I got the jackass and I got the ox. They're amongst two of the dumbest creatures, two of the stupidest creatures on the planet. But both of them are smarter than Israel. You know why? So anytime that you call yourself a Negro, an African American, a Christian, a Muslim, a Jehovah Witness, a secularist, a humanist, anytime you call yourself any of those things, I don't care how wise you think you are, you are dumber than both the jackass and the ox. Because you don't know who you are. He said, when you want to know Israel, go find the people in the world that can't tell you where their homeland is. Because if you go to somebody with slanty eyes, I guarantee you he's going to tell you whether he's from Japan, whether he's from China, or whether he's from Korea. Korea. I guarantee you that. I guarantee it. You see, even though they got slanty eyes, when we look at them, we all think they came from the same place. But each one of them will say, I'm not Chinese, I'm Japanese. I'm not Japanese, I'm Chinese. I'm not Chinese or Japanese, I'm Korean. Because they can tell you. So that makes them, that wipes them out. There's no way in the world that they could be the father's people. When you go to the European man who's handling the Bible and painted the false, it, uh, false, uh, image, when you ask him where he come from, he can tell you, well, I come from Germany. I come from Scotland. I come from England. I come from Britain. I come from Great Britain. I come from, he can tell you where he come from. That automatically disqualifies him. He can never be God's people because God's people can't tell you where they come from. Go over there. Go over there in any of them places. Go over there where the Africans are. You see the Africans right here. You can ask the Africans right now. Where are your homeland at? Where are your homeland? Oh, I come from I come from Kenya. I come from South Africa. I come from he can tell you with pinpoint accuracy where he comes from. So this disqualifies him as being the father's people. And you can go over there into to the land of Israel and you can deal with them Khazarian Jews and ask them where they come from. And they can tell you, well, we are from Kazaria. They tell you with their own mouth when they call themselves Ashkenazi Jews. We're from Ashkenaz. We're from Ashkenaz. We're the sons of Ashkenaz. We're from Poland. We're from Spain. They can tell you. They can tell you. You see? And see, I'll tell you another thing. Even if them fake Jews try to tell you that they from Israel, they automatically disqualify themselves as being the father's people because the father's people is dumber than a box of rocks. They don't have no idea because they don't even consider the question. He said, my people Israel, they don't know. The ox knows his owner. He said, but Israel don't know. Who is forefather is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said the jackass knows his manager's dwelling place or his master's crib. He said, but Israel, they don't know that they ran out of Jerusalem and fled into Africa and were sold from Africa. He said they don't even consider it. They hear people saying that they were sold from the banks of West Africa, but they don't even consider the fact that if they was Africans, who would have sold their own people into slavery? They don't even consider the fact 
that the African soul people that look like them but was not them. They don't even consider the fact. He said, you're going to know Israel when you see him. Because Israel got a curse on him because of his disobedience. And I caused him to discontinue. Even thou, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 4, even thou shall discontinue in the heritage that I gave you and shall serve your enemies in a land that you know not. What people don't have no recollection of their homeland? What people don't know have no recollection that they are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? What people have been sent into a world that is not theirs, that neither them nor their fathers had knew, that they forgot their Hebrew language and their Hebrew roots and their Hebrew culture and now had to speak the English language. What people have been caused to come into a land that was not theirs and then serve them? Note this for certain, Abraham, that thy descendants, thy children, thy offspring shall be strangers in a land that is not theirs. They shall serve them and they shall be afflicted for 400 years. What people on the planet can line up with the fact of being sent into a place that was unfamiliar to them and made slaves out of and then was in that place that can be trapped in the history books, in the world that you are living in, that they came in, this country, Jamestown, Virginia, in 1619, and in 2019, the Negro is still the lowest person in this country, though all kind of migrants have come into this place and excelled. What people could still be in the place of servitude after 2019 would mount up to be 400 years of a fulfilled prophecy? He said, but after that, after that 400 years is up, I shall judge the nation that did it, and then my people shall come out of there with great substance, even in this history that we are living in now on the news when you turn. CNN on and you look at the presidential candidates and look at the people that's running all they talking about is reparation this reparation that reparation that well it ain't because no coincidence it's because the most high said after 400 years that the Israelite who lost his history and was declared to be a negro after he had been there serving everybody the Chinese man the Arab man the African man the Asian man the East Indian man the white man after he had been a serve it in a land that was not his and they threw dirt in his face for 400 years shot him down 400 years 400 years left him in poverty after he had done those things for 400 years I'm going to judge every single nation and my people going to come out of there with their great substance so the Chinese man got to give back everything that he took because the curse is now about to be placed on him the European man got to give back everything that he took because the curse is about to be placed on him. It's placing on the African, on the Arab, on the East Indian, on the Asian man, on the Chinese man. God said they're going to give back everything. It's a righteous thing to recompense tribulation on them that have troubled us. And because they have troubled us, we say like Israel said to Achan, because you have troubled us this day, the Most High shall begin to trouble you. And as these curses get lifted, we want our brothers and sisters to be encouraged to know that everything that was used against us was a fulfillment of the most highest word when he said no weapon that was formed against us should be able to prosper and every weapon that was ever known to man had been formed and used on the so-called negro but he have not been able to be consumed period period I would apologize for that, but I can't. Because when that stuff starts coming through my mind, I can't shut it off. And sometimes people think that I'm fussing. And sometimes people say it's for anger. But it's not none of that. It's just that when it starts flowing, I can't turn it off. And it gets it gets delivered in the same manner that it's coming. So I'm not a hateful person. And I'm not a mean person. And I'm not angry at the world. 
And I'm not a racist and I don't hate the different nations of the world. But the most high is going to bring judgment on all of those. He's going to bring tribulation on all of those that have brought tribulation on his people. And that is final. So when we talking about this, we must get our people to understand who they are. So that they don't be in the most high's way. Down where the white folks is it, it partying and trying to have a good time. We got to get our folks to understand who they are so that they don't be the moved in next door trying to be like them and marry their children and all of that stuff. We got to show our people who they are. Where are you, so-called Negro, that call yourself a Christian? Where are you? How can you identify yourself when it comes to the scripture? How can you do it? How can you find yourself? How can you find yourself? Come on, prodigal son, sleeping in a hog's pen, separated from everything that was good. When are you going to come to yourself? How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity and you scorners delight in scorners? Pull yourself together and get up and come on back to the father that's waiting on you. What are you going to call? What are you going to call yourself? Negro? The Mexican can say he's a Mexican. The Russian can declare that he's a Russian. The European can declare he's a European. The, the Chinaman can declare he's a Chinaman. But who can the Negro declare that he is? Come on, Christian, that you think that you know so much word? You think you got that thing right? You think you got it right? You're talking about what Paul said, what Paul said. There's either neither Jew nor Greek nor nothing. You're thinking about that, but you still can't declare like Paul did who you are. Paul declared it before the Gentiles. When they say it, the Israelites' name was changed to Christian. Paul declared that that was a lie. He said, no. Nah. Have God cast off his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite born of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Who can you declare that you are a Negro? Because as the Most High is reversing and lifting these curses up off of his people, his curses are about to go on the enemies. And God forbid that you would be to join yourself to the ones that's about to be judged. When is your time to rise and be delivered? So let's go to the word. Let's go to the word, and then I got a video for you. Shalom, Prince, Priest Isaiah. I tell y'all, y'all get the chance. Y'all go and check our young priest out, Isaiah. Isaiah, y'all Shiraz. Y'all go in there and check our young priest out. This is one of the most gifted and anointed young men that I have um, been ever graced with his presence. I thank the most high. And I say this with the most uh, humble spirit that that though people call me elder, it's me that's being that the most high have allowed to come before the presence of great men. And there are so many great men in Israel. But great men in Israel, we got work to do still. There's still plenty of our people that don't have no idea who they are that have become Achans among the family of Israel. So let's go and read the foundational scripture, the foundational scripture, which is going to be Deuteronomy 30th chapter. That's where we're going to go. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And if you don't understand who you are, it's sad. It's sad. That's what Solomon Moon said. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, then lose his soul? That you lose your soul, that you ain't never even live. You have lived all this time in this world and experienced all these things, but you ain't never lived the life or came in contact with the life that the Most High meant for you to live. And then you perish. And so nothing else profits you. I don't know who that was when somebody was calling. Hold on, y'all. One second. Don't go nowhere. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Y'all know I ain't going nowhere. Foundational scripture. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among the nations, whether the Lord God hath driven thee. See, the only nation that hath been driven into all the different places in the world 
is the Negro. The children of Israel. Ain't nobody else been driven all over the world and made slaves out of. So the Most High said, we're going to call these things to mind. What are we calling to mind? We're calling the blessings and the curses. Because the Negro, before he ever became a slave, he was fulfilling all the promises that the Most High had made to him. And after our father Solomon did wickedly in the father's eyes and then Israel went into rebellion because of a lack of spiritual leadership, then the curses came upon us. And so we curse to be slaves in all nations. But there was a point in time for us to wake up. He said, and when we start waking up, we will have a responsibility to call the blessings and cursings to mind because it's the blessings and the cursings that will begin to reunite us with the heritage that we once had that we lost before we discontinue in our heritage, according to the prophet Jeremiah. And we were to call to mind uh, the curses that we will go up under, that our ancestors declared we were going up under because they had a confusion of faith, because they had transgressed the Most High's laws, and they didn't listen to the voice of the prophets. Therefore, they told us <coughs> what was happening. They said, therefore, is the curse poured out on us, which is written in the oath of the law of Moses. So we use the curses to call those things to mind so that the brothers, the Negroes, the Israelites that still don't understand who they are can have a means of identifying themselves since their name was changed. The only way that you can identify somebody is through their genetics and our genetics is tied through the word of the most high. And if you don't believe me, that's why after Cain and Abel was killed, everything started over and in chapter Chapter 5 of Genesis said, this is the book of the generations of the sons of Adam. Then we get to the 10th chapter where everything was destroyed and started over again and said, this is the book of the generations of Noah. And he had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And each one of them spawned different nations of people. And in order for us to understand and be able to interpret the scripture correctly, we must be able to identify with one of these particular classes of people so that we can understand which one was cursed. Cursed be Canaan. And we can understand which one would be enlarged. The borders of Japheth, which should be, would be enlarged. And then we, we, uh, we can understand who would carry the blessing of the Most High in the word. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, which from Shem come the Israelites. But if you can't discern which one of these families that you are a part of, how are you going to discern what your purpose is? You see, but we're dealing with a people that have been scattered because only the Shemites have been scattered throughout the four corners of the earth. The Shemites, those that come from Shem, come from the loins of Abraham, who comes Isaac, who comes Jacob, who comes 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Who comes one tribe, the fourth son of Jacob, which would be removed far from his borders, according to Joel, third chapter. What have I to do with you, Tyre or Zidon and the coast of Palestine? You have taken my silver and my gold, my goodly things, and you have carried it into your temples. And the children of Jerusalem, that re the children of Judah that resided in Jerusalem, have you taken and sold them into the hands of the Grecians and then removed them? Far from their borders. So you have a group of people that have been removed far from their borders and sent in the lands that they know not. And so the most high here is saying, when we call to people's mind these things that happen, our brothers will simply be able to say, man, that is me right there. That didn't happen to nobody else. We are to call these blessings and these curses to mind amongst all of the places that we've been scattered. And because this is the a phenomenal work of the Most High, some Simultaneously, at the exact same time, all over the world, the Israelites are calling to mind the blessings and the curses among the Father's people and reuniting us with our heritage. Now, nobody else has been scattered into the four corners of the earth. And no other nation on the planet is witnessing this thing that's taking place amongst Israel. But we have to keep these simplistic messages flowing because we cannot be content until all of Israel is on its feet. Hallelujah. He says, he says, 
and thou shalt return to the Lord thy God and obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, and thou and thy children with all thy heart. And that's why we're talking about our sisters and our brothers. When the curses get reversed, no longer can we be a crackhead because the crack was a part of the curse. No longer can we be on cigarettes and on alcohol and on stripping poles. No longer can we be pimping and so hungry and consumed by money that we'll do all of the things that we've done when we was up under curses. We must come back fully with our whole heart ready to serve the Most High. If he's going to reverse these things, everything in our life have to go into reverse. And where we seem like things are too powerful for us to overcome, we must start praying for one another that the Most High will give us the strength to fall into the place that we are supposed to be in. Hallelujah. It said that then the Lord God will return your captivity. He will reverse your captivity and will have compassion on thee. But before he can reverse your captivity, you must first realize that you are a captive. And he'll have compassion upon thee and he'll return and then he'll gather us from all the nations where we were scattered as slaves. And if any of us were driven out into the uttermost parts of the heaven, from thence will the Most High gather us, and from thence will he fetch us. And the Lord God will bring us into a land of our fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. And the Lord God will circumcise our heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God, and with all thy heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. And the Lord thy God will put all of these curses upon thy enemies and upon them that hate thee. Now, we see from the physical things that we have been through as a people that we can identify the curses on us. Now, now we can see through the curses being lifted off of us and put on our enemies, we can identify. See, we'll be able to identify who this book is talking about when it comes to these curses being put on everybody. And the curses is going to be put on all nations that conspire against us. So let's go. Today we're going to deal with another one of the things that's fueling the curses. That's fueling the destruction of the heathens. So let's go and take a look here. Let's go and take a look here. Let's go and take a look here. Let's go. Michael Oates, a lifelong welder, is recovering from a 10-year opioid addiction, which began when he took Vicodin for pain while working in a steel mill. Did you lose the job? Uh, actually, my job went to China, and uh, that was my excuse to do even more pills. Have you worked since? I've had four or five different jobs since then. And what happened to those jobs? I lost them all due to being addicted to opiates. They would random drug test me, and I'd be like, well, see you later. You know, I'd walk out. I even uh, got caught one time with uh, synthetic urine in my underwear because I I got pretty slick at using that, you know. You now, check this here out. Now, check this here out. You see, he can't keep a job, so he can't take care of his family. And the reason why he can't keep a job is because... He keeps testing positive when he got to pee. Now, look at this. He will put all of these curses that was on us, on his enemies. Now, the only way this drug testing thing came into play is so that it can become a great screener to keep the Negro or the Israelite from having good employment because they would flood our community with drugs and the even simplest of drugs we become a part of because we did drugs and drank just trying to keep our head together because of the circumstances that we were up under. But they knew that the chances of a Negro passing a drug test was almost slim to none. So they instituted this drug testing thing as a means to get employment. You see, now, now, see, now it's amazing.
Because, see, when our people was on heroin and on crack, them getting a the job was crazy. There was no facility to help them along the way. There was no rehab that they could go to. And then uh, because of the abuse of it, these people waged a war on our people because of the drugs. And they start just lock our people up. They just lock us up. Locking us up got us off of drugs, but it made us slaves. They couldn't put nothing together while we was out here that would get us off of drugs where we can now get a good job and have a productive life. So they just straight up locked us up. But now these people here is something different from them. See, now the whole workforce where the middle class used to have the good jobs paying from $50,000 to $140,000 a year. So you see, they can't even get people to work the job because their people are on drugs and they can't pass a drug test. Therefore, the workforce is suffers and it don't get filled. And they still have a wicked mindset as though they don't want the Negroes in these positions because, oh, God forbid that the Negroes would now begin to make this type of money and begin to help their people and, and they're the only ones that can fill these high paying positions so now the companies are suffering so they are forced to shut down 10 companies and produce one company like Amazon because they can't get the employees to keep these companies running and they don't want to put the Negro in that place fear that he will take over so they established an Amazon and then they closed a thousand Kmart's, a thousand Targets, a thousand Walmart, and they closed a thousand malls. And so now you got to buy like this. But look how many of they people can't keep a job. All praises to the most high. Hallelujah. That we see him doing what he said he was going to do. Let's keep going. I was stashed in my underwear and I go in and it's synthetic urine. It's got everything in it that you need to make them think it's your urine. Out of work for three years now, Oats is just one example of how the opioid crisis has decimated the American workforce. Business owner Clyde McClellan has seen plenty of other examples. We have people that come in on a regular basis looking for employment that are obviously under the influence when they come in. Really? You can tell? Oh, yeah. They look like they're, they're walking dead. I say, you know, we're going to send you for a drug test. And what is the drug test going to show us? Most of the time, uh, if it's pot or booze or, or anything like that, uh, they tell me. If it's something other than that, they don't come back. McClellan owns American Doug and Stein in East Liverpool, Ohio, once known as the pottery capital of the world, with dozens of firms. Foreign competition has since wiped out all but two of them. McClellan owes his survival to his top customer, Starbucks. You think would-be workers in town might be flocking here, but they're flocking to drug dealers instead. One day I was looking out of my office in 2015, and there were two policemen standing in my driveway with rifles. And I went out, and I knew one of them, and I said, what's going on? And he said, well, we're raiding this house that's next to your building and for heroin distribution. And these indelible photos of a couple overdosed in their car their son in the back seat Look at them. were snapped just three blocks from here. Look at them. They overdosed with their kid in the car. American mug and stein. But you do need to be clean. Half of the applicants aren't. Now, I've been an employer in this area since 1983. Drugs were not at the forefront when you were talking to somebody about possible employment. Now the first thing we think of is are they on drugs? How do, how do we find out what kind of references? Somebody came in here looking for a job with a reference from one of your other employees? He was using this person as a reference, and when we asked the employee, he said, he's a dope head, he steals money, he has stolen money from me. Obviously, we didn't bring him in. <laughs> Donna Debo has been there. A full-time waitress, she was prescribed opioids <sighs> after a car accident. In time...
I would go into all the stores. My trunk and my back seat would be full with everything. Sears, I'm no longer allowed on their property. I stole so much from them. I probably own their store. And then there was her daughter's new cell phone. We had some people over, and all of a sudden it just came up missing. Well, I made it look like it came up missing. I am the one actually, in fact, that did it. You um, stole it from your daughter at... Now, now, see, let's look at this here. <clears throat> Because like we said, when we start looking at this book, see, one of the things our brothers got to understand is that, you know what, <clears throat> if if somebody <clears throat> asks you what your nationality is, and you say African American, you're in trouble, because you don't know who you are, you see? But the curses that we've been under will identify us for who we are. When it came to Israel, it said, Jeremiah said, what? What's up with Israel? Is he a homeborn slave? Is the only reason why he put on this earth is to be somebody's slave? Because that's all that the Negro done been through. He went. He was on the walls of Egypt, looking like the Egyptians in in, in Egypt slavery. You see, in, in Babylonian captivity, in slavery, in in, in Greek uh, Medo Persia slavery. Uh, in, in Greek slavery, uh, Roman slavery, it's, it's six, seven captivities that we have already been in that ain't nobody else been in, that we still can't identify ourselves. So we're not no African Americans. Now, one of the other ways that Israel could be identified is it, it the Bible in the book of Isaiah, it said, and this is the people robbed and spoiled. They are hidden in holes and in prison houses. He said, you'll know who the Israelites are because they'll make up the vast majority of people that's hidden in holes and in prison houses. You see, but these curses are being reversed because of what the Most High said, that our punishment was only going to last for a time, for a season, a 400 year period. That can be substantiated even by the government institutions that you believe in. Now, the curses are being reversed. So now you got the white folks that they can't get no jobs because the drugs that once hit us as a curse now is hitting them. And they can't pass a drug test now. And so, and so now they stealing and everything. So guess what? The same way we was a people robbed and spoiled, hidden in holes and then hidden in prison houses. White people, the acceleration of white people, European people going to prison is growing at a rapid pace. Pretty soon their jails will be filled with them. Not going to be filled with us. Not going to be filled with us. So let's continue. And so Scott Schwinn was a well-paid machinist when his addiction took charge. I was just working to supply myself. I would have uh, people come to my work, deliver stuff to me at work. You know, at the on, machinist? Yeah, shop. I was on third shift, so they would come at night and bring me stuff. But that's how I messed the job up, is I wouldn't show up or I was doing shady stuff, like having people come there. I'd be in the bathroom for half an hour, so I lost that job. And then I've had other jobs, but I've never been able to keep them keep a job for long because of the addiction. So how long have you been out of work now? Uh, since 2011. Schwind, Oates, and Debo are now sober and enrolled at Flying High, a non-profit program in Youngstown, Ohio, to get those out of the workforce. Now, you see that? You see that? And we could, if we could, we want to. You see how when it comes to them, they put programs in place. They put programs in place. That's like that's like uh, that's like the prophecy that went out to uh, what was that? It was a prophecy that went out to Edom them anyway, and it said that the Lord was gonna make the most desolate, and then they shall say, "But we shall be, we shall rebuild." See, that's the arrogance. They'll go and put things in place for their people. Where they know that they was using all these things strategically as a means to destroy our people. So because they're not playing fair, the most high saying, well, I know you ain't going to acknowledge what's really happening. So guess what? 
I'm just going to let your people go on and die. I'm just going to let them go on and die from opioid abuse. And so that's what's happening. They people are just gone and die from opioid abuse because they're not going to act right. They're not going to act right. They just go, you know, they don't, they don't say that, that everything, everything is about the black man. Everything is about the Negro. Now, I'm going to show you one more, and then we're going to end the video. I'm going to end this. Let me show you something. Let me show you something. Okay, let me show you something. I'm going to read the scripture though first. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the scripture first. Let's go to Genesis chapter 13. Like the shalom to all the brothers and sisters. I have everybody know. I'm going to keep reinforcing this. That the Negro does have a name. It's a lost name. It's a forgotten name. But it's the name that the Most High gave him. And it's the name is Israel. Israel. That's what it is. Uh, where am I about to go? We're about to go to Genesis chapter 13. I don't think it's chapter 13. We're going to do this and let it ride. And sometimes I wish the most high could just let me have a, uh, just a, uh, let me have a, just a nice chill, chilled out, just talk like this. Let's go Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. And he said unto Abram, Know for certain that your children, your offspring, shall be strangers in a land that is not theirs. They shall serve them, they shall, be, they shall afflict them for 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in good old age. So this was a prophecy that the Most High had given to Abraham. He told Abraham that he was going to be the father of many nations. And then he also told Abraham that in route to him becoming the father of many nations, that he was to know for certain that his children, they would be strangers in a land that was not theirs. And that that place where they were strangers at, would, they would serve the people, and then the people would afflict them for a combined total of 400 years. The Negro came in Jamestown, Virginia in 1619. In 2019, would be 400 years according to that particular time clock. I don't argue about the time clocks one way or the other. I know one thing, that it speaks of a particular nation that caused, and I don't think, I don't know if the slavery factor and the servitude and the affliction have been more or worse anywhere than in America. It's with pinpoint accuracy identifying a specific nation. It ain't talking about the time clock or the time frame. So when it come down to the Americas, they arrived here in 1619. I ain't saying that they was in the West Indies or in Britain or in the Europe. I ain't saying they might have been over there in the 1500, but it's pinpoint accuracy. Speaking of a specific nation that when we came into this place, all of these different things would transpire with us. It said that nation that afflicted my people and served my people for a period 
of 400 years, I will judge that nation. And afterwards, my people shall come out with great substance. Let's show you how powerful the word of the Most High is. Either you believe it or you don't. Now, last year came the H.R. 1242 bill that was signed into law. The commemoration of the 400 years of the slave. 400 years of slavery. The commemoration is wrapped up and it's got wow with these white folks because they speak it in a different language. So Trump ain't commemorating none of the good things that came out of slavery because didn't no good things come out of slavery. But they want to remember the good things that came out of slavery because when we were their slaves, they flourished. So they want to commemorate 400 years of us being their slaves with no rights and no nothing and, and no fair equality. They want to remember that. My God, you can remember it all you want, but you will never experience it again. Because your destruction is at hand. So he's trying to go before the most high and incite his people against the Negro, the Negro who used to didn't know who he was, but now know that he's the most high's chosen seed, the Israelite that was sold into slavery because of disobedience, that when he turned and come back to the most high's law, statutes, and commandments, that the curses is reversed off of him. You think you can go before the most high and tell your European counterparts, let's remember the time when the Negro, when the Israelite didn't have no rights. Let's remember the time when we can hang him in a tree and nothing will happen to us. Let's remember the time when he was nothing more than a slave. You remember it and you remember it well while you getting your ass kicked all over the place. You can let that memory that you want to commemorate be stained in your mind so you'll know exactly why the things that are happening to you are happening. So remember it well. Remember it well. Yep. So he told Abraham, notice for certain, they shall afflict your children. But guess what? The time is going to come that I'm going to afflict them. I'm going to afflict them. And then your children, they will come out of that nation with great substance. Yeah, because that nation will be going into captivity. So let's take a look at what's happening in this world now, in this governmental system. Now, for a limited time only, Plus can help let's take a look and see. See, because that's how the prophetic word, that's how you're going to know prophetic words. See, prophet, prophecy had to be coupled with the reality of what's happening in your everyday life. Because, see, the Bible, the things that's written in the scripture, that had to leap off the pages and start staring you in your face in the life that you are living. 400 years is coming up, and the Most High is about to judge some things, and we know what we got coming. And the evidence of that is that, the prophecy will be made manifest in the life that we are living. So let's see. Turning to the 2020 presidential race, some Democratic candidates are being asked about coming forward on whether they favor reparations for slavery on the campaign trail. We've got to recognize back to that earlier point, people aren't starting out on the same base in terms of their ability to succeed. And so we have got to, to recognize that and give people the, a lift up. And um, there are a number of ways to do it. Part of my initiative, again, around the LIFT Act is that same point, lifting people up who are making less than $100,000 a year. What I have long believed uh, that this country should resolve uh, its original sin of slavery. And that one of the ways we should consider doing that is through reparations for people. 
I think I better read that again. I think I better read that again because somebody might just popped on here and didn't understand that if you're going to understand prophecy, let me tell you what prophecy is. Prophecy is not a prediction of something to happen. Prophecy is God in his foreknowledge looked down through time and seen the things that men would do. And then he exposed those things that men would do in the future to the prophets and the prophets wrote it down so that no, through the through the spirit that the Israelite could be shown things that would come so that he would know how to deal with certain things. So let me read this again. And this came even before the children of Israel were ever into existence. It came before this prophecy came long before God ever changed a, uh, Jacob's name to Israel. It came before Isaac ever had a son named Jacob. It came before Isaac was ever even born. It came through through the loins of Abraham, the one that the Most High told about his seed. Now, let me let you hear so that you can see all of these thousands of years later, this thing that the Most High told Abraham coming to pass. Let's read it. Verse 13, and he said unto Abram, know for surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. They shall serve them and they shall be afflicted for 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge. And after that, they shall come out with great substance. Well, we came here in 1619 as slaves and we was hung in trees, set on fire, fed the alligators, raped, beaten, castrated impoverished, ostracized, criticized. We was went through all that service and affliction in this hour. But the father is judging his people right now. And he said, when they get through, they will come out with great substance. Now, why are these people just now talking about this stuff when they could have been talking about this stuff 200 years ago? But why are they talking about it at the brink of 400 years? Let's go. Constitution and otherwise, that we compensate people if we take their property. Shouldn't we compensate people if they were property? There are massive disparities uh, that must be addressed. Uh, there is legislation that I like, introduced uh, by Congressman Jim Clyburn. It's called the 10 20 30 legislation, which focuses federal resources in a very significant way on distressed communities, communities that have high levels of poverty. So as I just indicated, you know, I think we have to do everything that we can to end institutional racism in this country. Senator Elizabeth Warren also stated support for reparations to the New York Times last week. But questions remain, what exactly would policy look like? Joining me here in New York is The Intercept senior political editor, Brianna Joy Gray. And joining me uh, in Washington is Washington Post reporter, Eugene Scott. So Eugene, break this down for us for a second here. What is the issue and why is it coming up right now on the campaign trail? Hi, well, it's coming up because of uh, a few interviews conducted by a reporter at the New York Times with Democratic uh, 2020 candidates regarding reparations. And uh, given that, it's led more uh, candidates to weigh in, giving their thoughts. Most recently, uh, Bernie Sanders at the CNN town hall earlier this week. Uh, there is some interest within the black community. More than 50% of African Americans do support reparations. Uh, but a recent poll from CNN and the Kaiser Family Foundation showed that the issue was... Let me show you something. Those, those so-called African-Americans that support reparations, guess what? That's just what they are. They're African-Americans and they support reparations because they want the heathens to give them some money so that they can spend it right back with them or give it right back to them in this kingdom. But the Israelites, you can't give me nothing. I want everything. I want everything that the Most High promised that I would be a royal priest and a kingdom of priests ruling in the, ruling the kingdom in this nation that the mountain of the Lord will be established in the last days in the time
top of the mountain and all of the nations would begin to flow to me, the son of Jacob, who the most high's world was committed to. You can't give me nothing. You give me everything because Esau is the end of the world and Jacob is the beginning of that which follow. You can't give me nothing. Why would I settle for a piece of the pie when a whole pie is mine and you dog now will eat the crumbs that fall from your master's table because the Lord will have mercy upon Israel and yet choose Jacob and he shall bring them back to their land and the stranger, the wicked heathen, the sojourner he shall sojourn now he shall be a stranger in a land that is not his and he shall join himself to me and I will bring him into the kingdom that the Most High have prepared to me and I will possess him in my land as a servant and as a handmaid and those that afflicted me are going to be afflicted. Those that oppress me are going to be oppressed and I'm going to rule over them with an iron fist so don't try to give me no handout. I want everything. I want everything, everything. It's largely unpopular uh, with most Americans. More than three in four uh, Americans do not support reparations. And so what you're seeing is uh, uh, candidates who are hoping to win uh, black voters uh, you see that? One in four don't support reparations. That's for our Israelite brothers to understand. It's only one out of four of us that's wide awake. Three of us are still asleep. So the work got to intensify of letting our brothers know who they are. Because we ain't going to sleep until four out of four don't want to hear nothing about no reparation. We want the whole thing. We want you subdued. According to Revelations 13 and 10, we want to see the scripture fulfill itself when it said that he that lead in the captivity is going into captivity. And he that killed us with his sword, we are going to put to death with our sword. We want to see the scripture fulfill itself. For this is the patience of the saints. You keep them crumbs that you try to offer us. We don't want them. And talking and discussing an issue uh, that could ultimately make them unpopular with some more mainstream or moderate Democrats. And getting uh, them on the record with this uh, has been a focus of uh, the New York Times, at least in the last uh, week or so, and other media outlets. Brianna, you pointed out the difference between supporting this idea of reparations in theory and actually creating substantive policy. Yeah, and there's a big difference there. I think that what you've heard from all of the candidates is that they, they agree with the, the moral question at hand. In fact, uh, Castro said this explicitly. I don't see this as a political question. He says he thinks of it as a moral question. And the moral question is easy. Obviously, there is a debt that's owed to a population that was literally enslaved and for 100 plus years afterward um, lived under various forms of de jure segregation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the question that's the more substantive question is what do you do about it? And I I think that while um, it's, it's, it's right that other groups have pointed out that well, I tell you what you can't do about it. You can't pay me with money with a dollar that ain't worth two cents. You can't pay me with a dollar that ain't worth two cents for the blood that was spilled to my ancestors. You can't pay me with a dollar that ain't worth nothing for you raping my daughter and, and raping my mama and raping my grandma. You can't pay me with no money that ain't worth nothing for me to be impoverished and suffer all the abuse that I didn't suffer. You couldn't give me no money from a dollar that ain't worth two cents for locking me up in prison for 30 or 40 years when I hadn't convicted a, a, a committed a crime. You can't pay me with a dollar that ain't worth nothing for impoverishing me and slandering my name in all of your TV shows and then making me a coon and a buffoon in all of your Hebrew or your Hollywood movies and, and making me to be a byword and a proverb and a detestable reproachable people in front of all the nations, you think you can give me a dollar that ain't worth nothing and I'm going to be content? Are you kidding me? And this is the message that we need to send to our brothers and sisters that will come on TV and start talking this nonsense. You might pay them, but you won't pay us. We ain't taking it. We ain't taking it. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom suffered violent and the violent going to take it by force. You're going to give us our stuff back and it ain't going to be because you want to. Other people have received reparations, um, uh, whether it's 
against Jews following the Holocaust as part of the reconciliation process, and that that would be very meaningful for the country. I think the difference is that people haven't, um, these, these candidates are just now bringing this up without having done the work of explaining to the American public why it is that reparations are deserved, and actually doing the work, the political work, that would shift those popularity numbers the same way Bernie Sanders has managed to shift popularity numbers around issues like Medicare for All over the past few years. So, Brianna, if you're looking at this through a political lens, which now we're in 2020 and, you know, we're seeing traction on this, does this move the needle in the African-American community in America? Is this a mobilizing issue that's going to get people out to vote? You know, black Americans support reparations more than other groups, but they don't support reparations more than they support a number of other so-called universal policies, like Medicare for all, like a $15 minimum wage. So even though I think there are parts of the community that genuinely see this as a significant issue, I think more significant is the idea that there's a candidate who's willing to um, vocalize explicitly support the community and that reparations is being kind of seen as a as a proxy for how invested a candidate is in the black mm, community i see eugene you wrote that backing reparations could be politically risky why is that and do you think that at this point the african-american community wants to hear about this more than other issues well, it could be politically risky because uh, while black Americans support reparations more uh, than most uh, other communities, it's not a huge priority uh, for African American voters. More than four in ten black voters don't support reparations. And what we know from other polling is that Democrats or people on the left in general want to get behind a candidate that they believe can beat Trump. And what many of them believe is that to get uh, you need to get some of the voters who actually voted for Trump in 20. <clears throat> now, and that's just going to let you see just how far this country has fallen. <laughs> that just lets you see because they, they, they try to do all of this to beat a dude that can barely recite his ABCs. That just lets you know that the Bible said that <laughs> uh, that's a trip. That's that's that that curse is something, man. This is the curse right here. Uh <laughs> it's a curse right here. They try to beat Trump. They try to beat a known child molester. A known rapist, a known thief, you know, a, a known drunk. This dude is known for everything. A known liar, a habitual liar. And and all of these Democrats over here, they trying to heap up ways to, to beat Trump. But notice this. What were they talking about? They were talking about reparations, right? Who is reparations directly going to affect or impact? It's going to directly affect or impact the Negro, the lost Israelite. So as long as he's a Negro, he can be manipulated with mediocre things. They, see, they know that the only chance they have of beating Donald Trump is to find a way to manipulate the Negro. And so they'll pull out a thing like reparations. But the Israelite, we're going to wage all our war on the Negroes, our lost sheep, as it relates to this voting stuff. Yeah. Because if it, you ain't going to keep manipulating our people because, to try to do something that you can't do on your own. You see, why you ain't bringing up a white issue? See, they can't bring up no white issue to beat Trump. Because Trump already beat them to the punch of white nationalist, nationalism. He already beat them to the racism card and all that. So they can't use that. And they can't beat him going against it because it's more white nationalists and racist. It's more, they, they are preserving they say so the Democratic Party look like they don't stand a chance. The only chance that they stand is that they'll be able to manipulate the Negro with this reparations thing. But we're heading that reparations thing off with the Bible. We're having that off. 
Because if you settle for anything less than what the Most High going to give you, you're going to be destroyed with the heathen. Because you're going to take your reparations and you're going to buy you a nice house in the heathen's neighborhood. And you're going to buy you a nice car from the heathen's car lot. And you're going to start living like the heathen and doing things that the heathen do. And the Most High going to judge you with the heathen. But the Israelite ain't going for that. So, in a political arena, this is what's happening. According to a curse that was lifted off of us, that's now lifted on them. So, let me show you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. Now. The Lord shall send upon you, Democrats and Republicans, cursing. That means anything you put to your hand, your hand to is going to fail. Vexation. That means because of anything you put your hand to when it fails, it's going you're gonna have vexation of spirit. Your spirit gonna be frustrated because you can't be victorious and rebuke. That anytime you come out and try to manipulate our Negro, our lost brothers, that the Israelites going to raise up and rebuke you with this word of the Most High so that you won't be able to manipulate us. That's what the Most High is sending upon you. He said, the Lord shall send upon you curse and vexation and rebuke in everything that you set your hand to do until you be destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of their doings whereby thou hast forsaken me. So the Democrat, you ain't going to be able to come up with no heap up, no ways of manipulation to where you can beat the Republican because you're going to get hit with cursing, vexation and rebuke. And the Republican, he may stay in office, but ain't no decision that he make. He going to get hit with the same thing, cursing, vexation and rebuke until this whole kingdom and this whole empire is destroyed because of the wickedness that y'all have done. So all we got to do is just sit back and keep waiting. I ain't got to take nothing you hand to me. All I got to do is just keep sitting back and keep waiting and keep wait, keep wait, keep waiting and keep watching. Keep watching what these opioids is doing to you. Keep watching all these jobs shut down as your people go into poverty and start jumping off of buildings. Keep watching how they get greedy and lose all their money on Wall Street and their 401k plan and watching how now they own food stamps and need government assistance and the Israelites just sitting back watching. Because he know that Esau, you the end, you the end of this world. Esau is the end of this empire, this rulership. And Jacob is the beginning of that which followed. So, so that's what it is. So I hope that brothers and sisters uh, get something out of the messages. Let's get our stuff built up, man. Let's look into our personal lives. And look at all the things that we've been doing on a daily basis as though it was just our natural way of living. And let's start reversing those things and doing something different. Let's hide a mindset like all this I've been doing, I've been doing up under the curse. So let me stop doing this and start doing what's contained in the scripture. What the scriptures say. Shalom, Sister Grace. What the scriptures say. Let me reverse that. Because that's what the Messiah, that's what the Bible is talking about. When he say, I'm going to reverse the captivity. It means that I, wherever I'm at, I, I can't stay there no more. If the sisters, you've been raised up, used to being my, nigga, don't tell me what to do. You ain't nothing, you ain't nothing, you ain't nothing. Let's see what it'll be like if you reverse that. Yeah, baby, oh, you got it going on. Yep, yep, my baby, he going to. Yep, he going to be good. Yep, you can do it. You can do it, baby. You can do it. I believe in you. I trust in you. I know you failed, but that's okay. That's okay. I'm on your team. I help you with whatever you need, what you need me to do, baby. Let's see our sisters go in reverse.
The brother that was too busy trying to manipulate a sister out of some booty. Oh, I need to get in them panties, boy. I'm going to get that. I'm going to get that. That's in the club drinking. Oh, yeah, that's what's up. Let's slap a high five. Let, let's see what will happen if you reverse that and don't treat your sister like that no more. Let me see if you reverse that. And say, damn, but I really I want to make you my wife. I want to build a family, have some children, all the wonderful things that the Most High got for us. This is what it's talking about. Going in reverse. And let the Most High put the curse of broken families on the heathens where the wife won't do nothing that the husband say. Look at the political arena. Look at the heathenistic families now that they are starting to become single parents and single home as the men blow their brains out because their women are no longer able to be controlled. You see? You see? You follow me? Don't go, sister, and try to be like the white woman because the father is disrupting her family and making her. See, the man can't even touch her. He can't even give her a kiss or give her a hug without sexual harassment. She's out of her way to destroy her own man. She's out of her way to destroy her own man. And what she really wants is your man because your man has the righteousness of the most high in him. She really wants your man. So she's going out of her way to destroy her man. But the only way she can have your man is if you are not content with your man and you striving to be like her as you disrespect your man like she disrespects hers. You see, as she divorces her man, you try to be like her, you go and divorce yours. Why not put it in reverse and say, I ain't never going to divorce mine. I'm going to pray about it. The most high, like, you know what? We got to be ready for this. You know what I'm saying? We got to be ready for it, you know? We got to be ready for it. So, so it is what it is. Let's uh let's do what we can do, man. And don't forget about our brothers and sisters that still still young and they walk, that don't know who they are. Just keep it simple. When we dialogue with each other, we can get deep. But when we dialogue with brothers that don't know, let's keep it simple. Shalom.